Good morning, everyone. My name is Zachary Gott. I also go by Kaiba on the Renegade on YouTube and TikTok. And today we're going to be reading my book, Godling Legacies, Lightning and Darkness. I know it's been nearly a year since the last audiobook came out, but this year I'm hoping to spend a little bit more time focusing on that. So uh, here's this audiobook, and the next um, audiobook will probably be the rest of Godly, since I only have the first chapter of it available right now. Um, but once that's finished and finalized, I expect that uh, hopefully by around the same time next year, the book that's going to be coming out in the next month, or maybe it'll be out by the time this audiobook is finished, um, Godly Legacies of the Land of Frozen Hearts will hopefully also be ready and probably around this time next year. But uh, I've had some family complications and some other things. Anyway, uh, if you've seen my channel updates, you know what's going on. So let's just go ahead and get right into it. Um, there are a couple of sections in here that are supposed to be narrated by a girl. Um, I'll it, You'll kind of understand when I'm pointing those out. Uh, it's supposed to be a back and forth between Damon Godley, the person who's actually narrating this book, and Videl Godley, the person who tends to narrate all the rest of them. But anyway, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get right into it. So here we go. Chapter 0, Godly, Fire and Ice. And again, I know it's a little bit weird that the chapter 0 for this book is Fire and Ice, but I only have chapter 1 of Godly out. Um, I'm sorry about that. Those books are huge and intimidating, and I'm going to really put my nose to the grindstone and get them done, or at least get the first one done this year, so you guys will kind of be starting to be able to get up to speed on it. But anyway, Chapter 0, Godly, Fire and Ice. Damon Godley had thought himself a mostly ordinary boy until he was 14 years old. He grew up in Athens, Greece, learning, making friends, and living the life of a regular child with his best friend Jacob. That was until the city was attacked by chimeras controlled by chaos, a primordial god who created monsters in order to obtain a body powerful enough to conquer entire pantheons. This attack led Damon to Mount Olympus, where he learned that he and Jacob were both demigods, and they were trained to wield their divine strength. After having been captured by Chaos and abused for his sick designs, Damon wanted to stop him from harming others, so he followed along with Jacob's plan. The idea was to travel the land in search of the other pantheons, and bring as many powerful deities together as possible to deal with Chaos's Chimera army, and hopefully find a god strong enough to defeat Chaos himself. Jacob was sent to the north, his estranged sister Junia was sent west, and Damon was sent to the east. Damon was specifically instructed to try and bring Rom of the Hindu pantheon and Sun Wukong of the Chinese pantheons to our aid, but by this point in the story, he had failed to obtain Rom's help or that of any god in the Hindu pantheon, and he was expelled from their land as a punishment. Desperate to secure the aid of Sun Wukong, Damon traveled north through the warring states of China as he sought out clues that would lead him to the Chinese pantheon. Traveling far east, he met the goddess Nuwa, who pointed him toward Sun's home of Mount Huaguo after he helped her save a school of sacred carp from a creature of the sea. Or so he tells me, anyway. Either way, I think I'll let him take over from here. Our story starts right now in Godly Legacies, Lightning and Darkness. So that would have been Videl narrating. Now we're going to move to Damon narrating the rest of the story. Chapter 1. Enemy of My Enemy. So, Videl tells me you want to hear about the time I saved the world, huh? Well, I was about 17 at the time, and I had been traveling the world on my own for about a year and four months. I remember I was starting to grow anxious because we were all planning on meeting up in about eight months, but I hadn't secured the help of any groups of gods thus far. I was worried I might have to return home empty-handed. Still, I wasn't about to give up anytime soon. I've always been tenacious, but that was especially true in my younger days. I spent weeks on the road, sometimes going days without eating, drinking, or sleeping, simply so I could make better time. China was a huge country that seemed to be at war everywhere in the north, and since I'm divine, I didn't need food or rest to stay alive like a regular person, and thought it would be best to remain on guard. Besides, I'm not much of a cook, and no one would take what little money I had, since it was all Indian currency, not Chinese. It was just after dark when I wandered into a small village I couldn't read the name of and was looking for somewhere I could find something to eat and maybe find some work. But I could immediately feel that something was off. Still, I was starving and desperate. So when I wandered into what seemed like a tavern, I didn't really take any notice of the stares of the locals on my back. I had become somewhat accustomed to it, being a tall Greek man with long, straight black hair to my shoulders and ice blue eyes. I sort of stood out. I believe at the time I was wearing my red traveling cloak, a pair of pants, and a ripped white cloth belt, but I can't remember anymore. 
I walked up to the bar and sat down, waiting silently as the barkeep finished serving a pair of men in battered military uniforms. While I was waiting, I looked around the bar and noticed everyone had their eyes on me, and each of them were wearing scale-like plated armor and rounded helms, but none of the uniforms were all the same. Most of them were in groupings, three or four red, two green, and a handful of yellow and more. I turned back to the barkeep and took a deep breath, centering myself. I noticed the room had gone quiet and looked up to him. The man who'd been talking to him wasn't speaking anymore and was just sitting there, staring at me. They both looked wild-eyed and jumpy. Any work I can do to get a hot meal around here? I asked carefully. Before he could answer, one of the men he'd been talking to wearing blue armor got up and approached, pulling out and pointing a crossbow at me. Just leave everything you got and get the hell out of here, and we won't have to hurt you, kid. He seemed surprised when I smiled at him. I told him, I ain't got nothing to leave, I just want an honest meal. The man pointed down at my hip. You can leave that pretty little sword you got there, he replied. My sword was one forged by Hephaestus, a legendary blacksmith of the Greek pantheon who'd been slain some time ago. It was made of a strange black metal and only had one side edged, but I'd grown rather fond of it. He was surprised when I stood up, so I told him, If you want my sword, you'll have to take it from me. He pointed his crossbow at me, but seemed surprised when I didn't back down. More men started standing up and loading crossbows as well. I put a hand to my blade and took a step back as the man pointed his crossbow at my head. You draw that thing and you're dead, he said flatly. I replied, we'll see, and as if in response to my reply, the man reflexively fired his crossbow. I drew my blade and slashed the bolt clean out of the air before stepping up and putting the tip of the sword to his throat. He was shocked, but his allies weren't backing down, so I shouted, if you morons try to fight me, I'll kill every last one of you, in the hopes that they weren't that stupid. Unfortunately, they were. Many of them fired their crossbows at me, but I was too fast for them to respond to as I flashed to each and every one of them, cutting them down more swiftly than their bolts flew. When I was done, the only one left alive in the tavern was the barkeep. The poor man was terrified as I approached him again. Please don't kill me! I've got nothing to do with them. General Wong and those beasts took over our town and killed most of our men. Please, I'll give you whatever you want, he cried. I just want something to eat, I explained. He nodded strongly and said, yes, sir, before running to a fire pit stovetop where a large pot of what seemed like stew was boiling. The man fetched me a bowl of the stew and some rice, and he even poured me a cup of tea. At first, he seemed like he was going to wait patiently while I ate but then he seemed to change his mind and ate with me. We didn't speak while we were eating, but something felt off about simply eating a meal while surrounded by corpses. When I was finished, I took the bodies behind the store for him. It was simple work and helped me refocus. After I finished, I approached the barkeep once more and asked, So tell me about this general. He and his men rode into town nearly a month ago, and ever since then they've terrorized us and eaten us out of house and home. Barely any of our residents are still here. Most of us fled when we realized it was hopeless but I've got a little son who's too sick to travel. I can't just leave him. And those bastards killed my wife, he explained as tears of fury fell from his eyes. The man clenched his fists and was too choked up to speak anymore. Well, I can't bring your wife and friends back, but maybe I can clear those assholes out for you, I offered, trying to hold back my rage. Please, just don't get yourself hurt. There's been too much bloodshed already, he begged. He seemed taken aback when I smiled softly and gave him a thumbs up. Don't worry. I'll make sure they pay for what they've done. He didn't say anything as I got up, turned, and left his tavern. I was still exhausted, but at least I wasn't hungry or thirsty anymore. I walked down the street and found myself surprised to find nearly a hundred soldiers all gathered around a gallows. Five men had already been hung, and as I walked up, they were decapitating the last victim they'd had tied up. I couldn't help but grit my teeth at their barbarism. And with this, the resistance has been defeated and this town is ours! Now we're ready to take the fight to the Ming Song family, one man shouted from the gallows. He seemed important. He was a puffed up man with studded blue armor that depicted a Chinese dragon in gold, but he was short, rotund, and had a long black beard and mustache. After he shouted to them, the crowd of mismatched soldiers started raising their fists and chanting, Long live Wang Fei Han! Long live Wang Fei Han! But they went silent as I rushed onto the stage. Hey, who the hell are you? He asked me. At the time, Jacob hadn't chosen Godly as our family name as far as I knew, so I'd introduced myself as such. I'm Damon of Athens. Are you General Wong? The man seemed surprised, but nodded. Well, it's nothing personal, but I've come to kill you and set this town free. General Wong threw his head back and laughed, 
but he didn't get out more than a chuckle before I took off his head. The fat old general went down with a single stroke of my blade, so I turned to his army as I flicked the blood from my sword. Nearly all the men drew crossbows and pointed them at me, making me sigh to myself. <sighs> this again? Don't any of you fight with honor? I asked with exasperation. As if to answer my plea, one of the largest men stepped forward with a massive battle axe resting on his shoulder. He pointed the axe at me as the men cleared a path for him. I'll fight you for the honor of General Wong, he growled. All right then, but if I win, you and your men clear out of this town and leave their people alone, I demanded. The man nodded without hesitation and raised his axe, beckoning me to attack. I rushed him and kicked his axe handle as hard as I could, making the weapon lash back and bash directly into the man's throat. I was surprised when he skidded back but remained on his feet. He grunted in anguish before regaining his posture and rushing at me. I took a step back and flourished my blade as I waited for him, and as he swung his axe at me, I lopped the weapon's head off its hilt, making it drop down and into the dirt and go tumbling. I sidestepped the massive man as he stumbled, but when all the men saw his axe missing its head, a deadly quiet settled over the crowd. The man growled as he turned back to me, but he was completely aghast when I pointed to his ruined axe pole. That axe could have been you, except your defeat. There was a scream of terror in the crowd and the men scattered like insects, including the one who challenged me. I gathered my wits and scanned the crowd, watching for any particularly large groups among them. I spotted one and caught up to them in an instant, knocking over the most decorated soldier among them and pinning them under my foot. One of them cried, What do you want? with terror. I couldn't help but smirk at them before I said, Tell me about this Ming Song family. A scrawny man in green armor stepped up with fright. He told me, The Ming Song family are a father, daughter, and son who control practically the entire province. General Ming Song Lai and his children are in charge of the military forces in Ordos and has final say over the state's military. But his daughter is largely in charge of the southern half and his son is in charge of the north. Okay, but why do you all want to kill him, I ask? Because that bastard conquered our lands by force. We were going to kill him and break apart his tiny empire to restore our own lords to power, a man in yellow said. Wait, so you're a rebellion, I asked? A few of them nodded, and I scratched the back of my head. Whoops. Still, you took over this town by force. How are you any better than the Ming Song family? We're fighting to reclaim our homes. Surely you can see the difference in that, the one in yellow said. Maybe, but if you're killing others in their own homes, as far as I can tell, that makes you murdering bandits just the same, I said. Most of them gritted their teeth. I took a moment to gather my thoughts before glaring at each and every one of them. Then I let the man out from under my foot. He backed away through the dirt and I told him, Accept the Ming Song's rule. I've killed your general, and if any of you plan to try and hurt me or these townspeople again, your blood will run through the streets with his. A few moments of silence passed as the men looked to one another, but all it took was for one to turn and run before the rest followed for fear of their lives. I sighed with relief, glad the ordeal was over. I found an empty ransacked house and laid down on a bed in a near-empty room. But no matter how hard I tried, sleep eluded me. I think I was anxious about sleeping in that place, worried they would come back and catch me napping. I laid there for several hours begging for sleep, but when it didn't come, eventually I had to get up. I wasn't out on the road more than three hours before I made camp and took a long rest, and when I awoke it was sunset once more. I traveled all night, but by morning I reached a fairly large village of stone and brick buildings built into a hillside and surrounded by foliage. I couldn't read the sign out front, but by checking with the only local in sight, I learned it was called Dongfu Village. The reds, golds, and purples of fall lined the leaves of nearly every tree and added brightness to the dusty town, but I arrived not long after dawn and many hadn't yet left their homes. The streets were nearly empty, and as I walked them, I felt a strange sense of dread as the near silence in the early morning was broken only by my quiet footsteps. I walked for several minutes before a pair of kids left their home and went running by with a puppy, so I asked them, Hey, where is everyone? Hey, who are you, mister? The smaller one asked in response. Our mom says we're not allowed to talk to strangers. Come on, Kang Wen, the bigger girl said, grabbing her little brother by the arm and pulling him away quickly. I sighed and watched them run away, annoyed I hadn't learned anything. I searched the streets for at least two hours without seeing a soul and it was beginning to make me suspicious. For it to be mid-morning with hardly anyone around was absurd. The silence was finally broken by the sound of a mismatched pitter-patter that could only be a running adult. 
With little more than my ears to go on, I ran toward the sound, desperate for any information. It wasn't more than a moment before I rounded a corner and accidentally crashed right into a man only a little shorter than me. We slammed into each other so hard it knocked me down and sent him tumbling through the dirt. I quickly got up and dusted myself off as I headed over to him. He was a bald Chinese man wearing a stained yellow robe and one sandal, and he seemed to have landed hard on his face. I bent down and offered him a hand. Are you all right? I asked, wanting to see if he would take my hand. He struggled with the pain a moment as he held his bloodied nose, but he took my hand and I helped him to his feet. As I helped him up, I couldn't help but notice his eyes. His irises were bright yellow, and it was like the pupils were shining blue stars. Yeah, I think I'll be okay, he sniffled. He had tears in his eyes as he checked his nose, but it appeared unbroken despite the redness and blood. I'm sorry about running into you. I'll have to try to be more careful. That reminds me, what were you running from? I asked. He looked to me and tilted his head. Running from? No, sir. I was running toward my home. I've been away for quite some time, and I've returned to see my sister and help her with some problem she's been having, he explained. Problem? I asked reluctantly, not sure I should wrap myself up in this guy's issues. He replied with a shrug and said, Dunno, she was pretty vague about it in her letter. I crossed my arms. So I guess this means you don't know anything about what's going on here then, huh? I asked with a sigh. No, I've only just returned this morning. Why? What's going on here? He asked with confusion. I don't know, but doesn't it seem strange that hardly anyone's around? I asked in reply. He looked at me oddly a moment before he paused, but then he said, You know, I did actually notice that. Old man Xiaoling Li wasn't at his shop this morning. He seemed pensive, so I decided to take my opportunity. Would it be an inconvenience for me to come and speak to your sister with you? If she's going to tell you what's going on around here, we might as well savor some breath and let me hear it too. You want to help, huh? Thank you very much, he replied, taking a deep bow of gratitude. I couldn't help but roll my eyes. Yeah, all right. Let's get on with it, I said.